Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's lovely to be here in Prague. Um, it's been my first visit since 1992. And the city is as beautiful and fascinating as ever. So I'm delighted to be here at this conference. And I'll be talking a bit about designing uh, better public services. If you're hoping for something about libraries, this is the wrong talk. But I think you've heard many interesting things about libraries already today. So from now on, we'll be thinking about public services instead. And so if this can work. So I'm Caroline Jarrett, and I'm a form specialist at the Government Digital Services. I'm our department, Government Digital Services, is part of the Cabinet Office, which has this impressive government crest as part of its name. And we're one of the smallest departments in the UK, civil service, but we're central for the whole of the civil service. And I'd like to take you back about 10 years to where we were in the UK in public services. So 10 years ago, we had a government portal for citizens. It was called DirectGov and it was orange. So if I wanted to tax my car in 2006, in order to be allowed to drive my car legally, I would come onto this portal and under motoring we can see taxing and MOT. And I would click a couple of times and it would take me, it was a portal, it would take me to the website for the appropriate department where I could um, tax my car. Has this microphone just gone off? No, you can still hear me? Great. Okay, so I could either come to the portal or um, I could know that the government department responsible for car tax is called DVLA, Department and Vehicle Licensing Authority. It had its own website. The acronym DVLA is very well known in the UK. I could just go directly to DVLA and I would come to this website. Um, it's got the two UK official languages, so I could choose whether I wanted to tax my car in English or Welsh. And um, they were working hard. All the government departments were working hard to try and do better government services. So, for example, here you can see that they were working hard to make sure that this website was accessible, which is a very good thing to do. <clears throat> In 2010, we had a change of government, and the incoming minister for the Cabinet of Office, Francis Maud, asked one of our well-known internet entrepreneurs, Martha Lane Fox, to do a review of digital government. And she wrote a report which I recommend to you to read. It's a um, very unusual government report because it's about six pages, very, very short. So that's the first thing that's unusual. And she called for revolution, not evolution. She said that every individual government department working at their own pace to make web services and government services better was not quick enough. And instead, she recommended that the government start a central service that would make things happen more quickly. And that's another really unusual thing about this government report, because the government said, yes, OK, and they did it. Wow. <laughs> So the Government Digital Service started in 2011, only a year later, and the first Gov.UK website started in 2012, only a year later. I've been working government for a long time. This is frantically quick. Yeah. So Gov.UK started in 2012. Now, Gov.UK is not a portal. It's one website for the whole of UK central government. Gov.uk is one website for over 330 government departments and agencies. So if we look at Gov.uk today, it's kind of not that different to Direct Gov, only it's not orange. But it's very different underneath the homepage. Okay? So today, if I want to tax my car, I can click on driving and transport and get to tax my car that way. I can click on renew vehicle tax and tax my car that way. But it will take me, if I remember DVLA, I can find the DVLA website. But the DVLA website is part of 
the gov.uk website. It's not a separate website. And I can tax my vehicle. Or if I just want to tax my vehicle and I don't care what department does it, I can just go straight to tax my vehicle. And that's also part of the gov.uk website. So I no longer need to know anything about DVLA if I don't want to. And most of us do not care which government department is responsible for what we have to do. We just want to do it. We just want to go directly to whatever government service we have to use. So, as well as there being over 330 government departments on gov.uk, that means that civil servants in over 300 government departments and agencies contribute to gov.uk. Everybody who publishes government content is publishing to one website. Everyone who designs a government service has to design it to work on one website. And what government digital service does is we provide infrastructure, so they actually run the website and keep it going. We provide tools, publication tools, other type of tools that allow our colleagues across government to contribute to the website. And we provide guidance about how to design better public service, services. And it's the guidance that I work on, so that's what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of this talk. And what's happened over the, those years since Government Digital Service has started was that in 2011, GDS started with one designer, and we now have quite a few more designers. But what we also have is many other designers working across government who are contributing to our website. So th at the heart of all the guidance that we provide for them, we have some very quite simple but powerful design principles, which are our main tool of guidance. So these are our design principles from Government Digital Service. Start with user needs. And we've just seen an example of that. Users need to get their car tax sorted out so they can drive legally. They don't need to know what government department provides that. And I'm going to talk some more about some of the rest of the principles in the rest of the time that we've got together. So let's look first of all at do less. Governments have a tendency to try and do everything. And the principle of do less is to say, do we have to do this as government? Or can we get someone else to do it? Or is someone else doing it better than we can? So for example, GDS has closed a lot of websites. And one of the ones they killed was Transport Direct. This was a government attempt to help everyone to plan public transport journeys. And uh, have you heard of a website called Google? You know, they do that now, probably better. So we didn't have to do it anymore. So you can save money, shut down the website. It's always good for a historic screenshot, though. But some of the things we do have to do, some of the things we have to do only government can do. So that's about designing with data, is, is creating designs and public services that really meet user needs. So I'll give you an example. One of the things that we urge our colleagues to do across government is to research continually. We're working in an agile way, we're doing small increments, we're testing them, we're making sure these things work. And we need to do research to make sure that we understand users and their needs, particularly users who have not got ability to access or use digital services on their own. And I'll return to that topic in a minute. We have to have new ideas, but we have to see if they're any good. Just because something is a new idea isn't make it always a good idea. We have to test it. And we have to really understand what are users' real problems? What do they really need to achieve? And so this means doing user research in every iteration, in every sprint, throughout the entire service. So historically, yes, government departments would often do perhaps some usability testing. They might do one or two rounds of usability testing a few weeks before release. That's fine, but what are they going to act on? Whereas now, our government colleagues are doing usability testing or user research every two weeks constantly taking their ideas out, making sure they really work. 
And our aim really is to find out what works, not what's popular. We don't really care whether people like it. What we care is whether they can do the job they need to do. Taxing your car, spending money to be allowed to drive legally, isn't as fun as playing Angry Birds, let's face it. It's just something you need to do and move on and have more time in your life for things that you really enjoy. So we need to find out. We watch people using things so we can find out what works and then we make sure they can use it easily. So we mentioned a little bit earlier about making sure that this works for, for people with mixed different abilities. So I'd like to focus a bit more on that design principle, which is about this is for everyone. So most people have okay digital skills and conference, uh, confidence. I was going to say, everyone at this conference has got great digital skills. <laughs> and the word sneaked forward. So we've, we've all got good digital skills, and we sometimes forget, unless you're helping someone who's not so familiar with the computer, we often forget how much we've learned and understood. If you're a business, then, okay, it's a commercial decision. You can decide to ignore people with low digital skills, and just design for people with okay to excellent digital skills. But many skilled people, people can have skills but not have digital skills. So, for example, colleagues at um, what we call the Home Office, which is the department that looks after visas and immigration, they did user research with people coming to the UK on um, high skills visa. So these are people with very high skills coming from outside the EU to work in the UK, but they don't necessarily have digital skills. So if you're a very skilled chef, what you know is how to hold a knife and use it effectively to create delicious food, you're probably not spending all that much time on a computer. So many people don't have the digital skills we expect them to have. And then in government, we have another problem, which is, Using a government service is often very stressful. It's often important to people. You might need money because you are poor without a job. You might need government money to help you live. If you're worried about whether you can feed your family or not based on getting the money, you're stressed. You could lose the digital skills you already have because the stress center of your brain, your amygdala, is going to soak up brain resources. So just by being government, we can lower the skills in people who are using our services. So we have to make sure that we understand that people who need government services have lower digital skills. If we design for people with low digital skills, everybody wins. We've, dis we've found repeatedly that when we make something work for everyone, even for people with low skills, what happens for the high-skilled people is it just becomes really, really quick. Very, very simple. Everybody wins. So I thought I'd give you an, exact, an example of what this means at a quite a low level of detail. Everybody familiar with a drop-down list, also known as a select box when it's on mobile? You know, when you have to choose your country from one of these? Yeah? <clears throat> Anyone ever been tempted to go for Afghanistan? This at the top. We, if we use these things every day, we can often forget that there's a lot of learning involved in knowing how to use them. You've got to click on it to make the list come up. You've got to click again on the item you want. You've got to let the item you want appear and then click again. So I'm going to show you a video. Um, this video can't be on the recording for confidentiality reasons. And I'll just explain what's going on as we go through. So. This is quite a young woman, she's in her 30s and she has an office job, but she's not very confident on a computer. And when we're testing with people with low digital skills, we often say, well, they'll say something like, well, I'm not very good on a computer, someone helps me. So we'll say, well, okay, can you bring that person with you? And we'll see what it's like for you in real life. So she's brought her boyfriend along who helps her. So let's see if this works. She needs to put in her date of birth. So she clicks, and she can't see the one she wants. Oh, why doesn't it? How do I get the one I want? She's 26. 
on the drop down. So if you go, if you click on the arrow. Sorry. Okay. So she tells her to click on it, but she misses. And now she's trying to click again, and she doesn't know she has yeah, to click, click on, on the, the scroll. Yeah, just click on the date. He tells her to click on it. And she's not sure what he means. Now she's lost it all together. Now she goes back. I don't know what you mean? I did click, click on it. Click on, click on mate. Yeah. She said, what do you mean click on it? And he says, click on there. So now she's going to try the month. Let's click on it. <laughs> click on it. Yeah, right. He says, click on there, and she said, <laughs> she said, I clicked on it, but it didn't work. He's got into a different oh, now she, no, she's going to try the year. <laughs> and then she tries to click on it again. Did you see what happened? There's a lot of clicking, and she doesn't know where to click. And him telling her where to click just makes her feel more anxious, and she still doesn't know where to click. All to put in a date of birth doesn't have to be that hard. You might think, well, I know how to put a date of birth in very easily by clicking on a drop-down. I definitely do, apart from it takes me ages to scroll down to how old I am. But for some people, it's just a real barrier. And we've seen problems like this with all sorts of different people, old people, young people, people who feel stressed. It's just not necessary. So these days, we're saying to people, do you really need a drop-down? You know, could you try using radio buttons or free text instead? And we're experimenting with some other formats that might make it easier for people. And if you're interested in the technicalities of programming, then I recommend that you look for Alice Bartlett's talk, Bin Your Select Tags, because she has a great way of explaining it. Now we say, OK, let's just let people type it in. Anyone with high digital skills, it will take you six seven keystrokes to type in that date of birth, it will be quicker for you than going through all those drop-downs. And anyone with low digital skills can still use it. If they can use a computer at all, they can type something. So you might say, OK, well, now we haven't got a well-formatted date of birth. People could ignore the hints and type in any of these things. They could put in... Uh, normally European style date of birth, they could put in a US format, they could put in a month in month in letters. Now we have to do more programming in order to accept a wider range of inputs in order to let, make that work. So now we have to do the hard work to make it simple, make it easier for users, but do more programming to make sure it all works. And so we also now often provide check your answers pages. So these pages let people have a look to see whether what they think they've put in matches what they want to send to the government. In many commercial environments, people wouldn't want to do that. But this is government. It's important. They want to see their answers and make sure everything is correct. They are happy to do the extra work. It's another step, but it's an important step, and it meets the user's needs. So those are some of the ways that we have to do the hard work to make it simple. We had a simpler format. We had more programming. We had to manage an extra step, all to make it easy. And there are other ways that we try and do the hard work to make it simple. So that example of the drop-down I showed you was really fine level of detail. But if you work in government, or indeed if you work in any organisation that has to collaborate with another one, you will recognise that getting two different departments to contribute to one thing, that's hard work. So this particular service, Check Your State Pension, one government department is responsible for collecting contributions to the pension, and another government department is responsible for paying out the pension. So they had to work together. It looks simple, but it's been hard work for them. So we provide guidance to our colleagues across government, but we also test our guidance on our colleagues. So it's not just about doing research with the general public. It's also to see whether the guidance that we offer really works for our colleagues. So here's an example. In 2015, we were explaining how to show errors on a screen. It says, for example, ensure error messages make sense when read by screen readers. 
So that's very important for accessibility. But could colleagues actually act on that instruction and really make something that would work with screen readers? Well, we did some research and we found out they could, but not really. What they really wanted was an example of how to do it. They wanted an example and some code so they could just take that code and put it directly into their service. And we researched this. One of the things you might notice is it says, instead of actually having an example error message, it has an instruction to the designer, descriptive link to the question with the error. So that this tells the designer they've got to write some text, otherwise they just tended to copy whatever example we put in there. As an example of testing what we're doing with our colleagues. And also our colleagues are all excellent designers themselves, so they contribute to our guidance as well. So another example was um, we had very pale boxes, otherwise known as the apple effect. Everything very pale and beautiful. So it turned out that we just had very pale boxes for collecting, uh, showing where to type on the screen. But some of our colleagues noticed that people with low vision couldn't see where they had to type. And then we tested darker borders. Just to show you before and after, this is too pale. That's dark enough. Well, maybe it's not quite so pretty, but it works. And it doesn't disadvantage everybody. So this is another example of iterating and iterating again, doing the hard work to make it simple. And then the, th the final one I want to give you more examples of is understand context, which is perhaps a bit, a bit subtle. But we need to understand not just when people use something, but where and how they use it. So we have a lot of users. There are 45 million users last month. And a lot of people are using gov.uk on mobiles. So this is the real time or slide from the data. Just over half of our users are using desktops. And about a third are using mobiles and 10% using uh, tablets. Now, we actually think that people using desktops are mostly using them because they're at work. Because if you look at just before January, which is the Christmas shutdown period in the UK, you see there's a massive dip in people using desktops. I think it's because those are all workers in offices who are not in the office at that time. And then you can see sort of wobbles over the summer. So we think that mostly people are using gov.uk on their mobiles if they're doing something for themselves. So we have to make sure that you can use the government services on mobiles. So for example, this is what tax your vehicle looks like if you're using it on a phone. And we also discovered that many of our poorest and most disadvantaged users only have access on a mobile. So you might not think you'd prefer to do a government thing on a mobile, but that might be your only choice. And we also discovered that one of the best ways to find out what context is like is to go and do our user research with our users in their own environment. So for example, farmers use gov.uk. And this is a picture of one of my colleagues, um, Jay, on the right, who's going out and doing user research with a family farm. So these are all the farmers around the kitchen table trying to use something and showing him what works and doesn't work. Getting out and meeting people is a very important part of what we do. And finally, make things open. It makes them better. I'm pleased that GDS gave me permission to be here today and talk to you. We're about trying to communicate what we're doing and learning from it. We have many GDS blogs. For example, if you're more interested in the technology than in the, the guidance, um, there's technology blogs, code repos in the open, and all that sort of thing. So I've put some links here of things that you can perhaps join in, might be helpful in your work. And most of all, it's all about finding out what works, not what's popular, getting out and watching people use what you do. And uh, with that thought, I'll say thank you very much for letting me talk about better public services. Thank you for your speech. Má někdo otázku na Caroline? I think that means any questions. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Okay, so thank you for your presentation. If, if anyone would like to ask me any questions later, rather than trying to compose a question in English in public at the end of a long day, then I'll be in the corner. So please feel welcome to come and chat. There's one question at the back. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. It was about the mobile version of our website. Do we have a responsive version or do we have a separate version for mobile? And the answer is definitely it's a responsive version. We have one website that adapts to whatever device you're using because people might use it on a tablet, they might use it on a um, a mobile phone which is tall but narrow, but also we have many um, people in the UK and colleagues who are uh, low vision, so they're using it on a desktop, but massively magnified, so it has to respond to them as well. So yeah, it's one website. One website does everything. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>